A lot of developers aspire to become architects. That chance to make all those important decisions about cross-cutting concerns, to be able to ride that architecture elevator, talking one minute with developers and the next with the CEO. The glamour, the power, the pay rise. How can just doing software design compete with that? Because design is not architecture. That's a good thing. Hi, I'm Emily Bache. I'm a software developer, creator of Saman Coaching. Welcome to the Modern Software Engineering channel. We are several presenters here, all with a common goal to bring you great advice on the technical aspects of software engineering. And recently, we actually announced a new host on the channel, Sam Newman. He's written several books about architecture, especially around microservices. And I have to say, I'm pretty much in awe of Sam for all of his expertise in this area. And I'm really glad that he's going to be adding his perspectives to the Modern Software Engineering channel. Because I think we could all benefit from getting better at architecture, not least because it's really expensive to get it wrong. As Grady Booch put it, architecture represents the significant design decisions that shape a system where significant is measured by the cost of change. So that's what architecture is. It's the design decisions that are expensive to change. So there's this kind of sliding scale between design on the one end and architecture on the other, because it's really the same kind of thinking that goes into both. So at the architecture end, there are decisions about whether to use distributed microservices or a monolith or which cloud platform to deploy on and how to handle data and transactions and workflow orchestration and all of that stuff, which is really difficult decisions with big impacts and lots of context that you need to understand. At the other end, then, you've got decisions about the nitty gritty in the code. What arguments should a method take? How do you design really good if statements? Use the positive form, avoid else clauses. Details matter for readability and maintainability. Fundamentally, both design and architecture are the same kind of thing. They are decisions. You're mapping business needs onto software. You're identifying good abstractions. You're communicating with stakeholders. You're understanding context. You're making intelligent trade-offs. So skill with design is very similar to skill with architecture. The difference is a question of the scale of the impact when you make decisions and the breadth of the context that you're taking into account. So it's this continuum between design in the small and architecture in the large that really interests me. In particular, the point at which decisions become expensive. You can imagine somewhere on this scale where on this side, the change is cheap, that's design. On this side, the change is expensive and those decisions are architecture. And what we obviously want then is to keep that point as far across as possible so that most decisions will be cheap to change. How do we then get reversible decisions that are software design? Well, I want to talk about several things and I'm going to highlight three of them. But first, I'm going to pause and point out that I have a new free guide out to my core must learn refactorings. There are a lot of tools and keyboard shortcuts that you could invest your time and energy in learning. But these are just the few that I really recommend that you make sure that you know. There's a link in the show notes to my guide so you can get your free copy. Let's go back to those three factors that keep design decisions cheap and reversible. Firstly, modularity. Now this is to do with good abstractions and good API design, and it's key to managing complexity in general. Dave Farley talks about this in his book about modern software engineering. It's very closely related to concepts like cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction, loose coupling. And getting good at modularity is a fundamental design skill at any level of granularity. Because a good design will have well-defined functions and classes and modules. A good architecture will have well-defined components and services. And this will make it easier to update and change that software. Because modularity means you can reason effectively about the impact of changing code inside a module. You minimize the blast radius of changes and you can update functionality more safely. The second important factor 
is having automated tests. I go on about this a lot. Because decisions become reversible when you can easily see the effect a change has on the system. You tweak something here, and then you see which tests fail. So you can see what behavior is impacted. Even if the code is not very modular, and you can't easily reason about the impact of a change, if you have good enough tests, they will tell you what behavior you ended up changing with a given code change. And you can still update functionality safely, relying on those tests. The third factor then, which is perhaps the most interesting of the three, is skill with refactoring. I often meet developers and architects who complain that their systems are difficult to change and update. Even though they've invested in good architecture, you know, microservices, queues, events, monitoring, and all that, but their design is inflexible. The business requirements are changing and the software is not keeping up. They've got modules or services with dependencies that just look a bit like spaghetti. And they've got tests, but they're too slow, they're too flaky, or they have too many mocks. And they just get in the way when you try and refactor. In that situation where your design isn't very modular, your tests aren't good enough, the point between design and architecture might have moved pretty far over. That is, if you define architecture as expensive design decisions, then legacy code has a lot of architectural decisions. Because even seemingly innocuous changes, like you know, changing the argument list of a method, can have expensive consequences. I've seen this kind of thing happen. You know, you change a thing here and then you realize eventually that there's some client you had no idea about that was relying on those precise arguments and it now doesn't work. Legacy code is full of those kinds of unexpected consequences. So in this context, being skilled with refactoring and being able to refactor safely is actually a way to shift the balance. If you know some good techniques and you can identify code smells and you know your tools, deterministic tools, for safely addressing those refactoring issues, you can improve code modularity. You can write better tests. You can make change cheaper. I would like to thank our channel sponsors who support us so that we can carry on making all these videos for you. And these are not just kind of random companies. They all have products and services that are very well aligned with the kinds of topics we talk about here on this channel. So please do take a moment, follow their links in the video description. Refactoring is not only useful in that legacy code situation though. If you're in the much happier position of seeing most decisions as cheap design and relatively few as expensive architecture, then refactoring skill enables you to keep it that way and to be even more ambitious potentially. Imagine the situation where someone from the business suddenly asks for something totally unexpected, wasn't in your roadmap, your architecture didn't anticipate this, and it's totally gonna make you loads of money. So what you want to be able to do is to react, yes. Yes, we could do that. The code is actually in a good enough state. That is a straightforward design change. It's supported by our existing architecture. We have the tools, we have the skills, we can update the design to support that safely. Yes, let's do it. But you don't automatically get to take advantage of that situation unless you also have that skill with updating design safely through refactoring. So to summarize then, design is not architecture. That's a good thing because by definition, we can change design cheaply. That ability comes from managing complexity through modularity, good tests, but also skill with refactoring, changing the behavior of existing code without breaking it. It's a key factor for enabling that kind of modularity and those good tests. And I'm convinced it leads to better software and happier developers. Happy coding.